All right, let's finish up our mini lecture for the weekend. This might be the weekend where we have the most mini lectures, by the way. So, um, yeah, it won't always be this way, but I do want to load this weekend up with mini lectures so that you have time because we have a week and a half before the test. So I figure I'll uh, load you up on the mini lectures now, and that way we can take more time. One of the topic I want to cover before we uh, have class on Monday, although honestly, if you're pressed for time, I think this one can wait. Uh, this one can, can wait more than the other ones because you're going to get these terms in lots of different ways. Um, okay, so if you're still listening to me, great. Uh, you definitely need to make sure you do this before our review session on Friday. So uh, here's f uh, the four ways. We've already talked about the different ways that you can show a protein. These show you the tertiary structure. They also show you the secondary structure, but th that's less important than the tertiary structure because it's the shape of the protein. Now here is, oh boy, where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Remember this guy? This is our globin. Myoglobin looks like this. And in fact, if I could organize it, I could hold it the same way. There's a little tiny heme group right there, okay? So uh, this is like the first representation, which is Jane Richards, uh, Richardson's um, ribbons cartoon structure. Just realize that we can do that. We can um, turn on the surface. We can basically say, what if I threw a sheet over it? And you can say, I put a surface over the whole protein. I can see it has this little binding cleft for the heme group. That's shown in red. You can see how it fits right in there, like a puzzle into a puzzle piece. The protein's job is to bind heme. And heme fits right into the protein that way. Then you can do different things. And we'll do this in the computer lab uh, next week. You can turn on the ribbons, and then you can turn on particular side chains. Here, they've turned on leucine, isoleucine, valine, and phenylalanine side chains. Think about what those four have in common. None of them has PKAs. None of them has even titratable groups of any sort, even polar groups. They are all nonpolar. Remember hydrophobic things like to hide from water? They're all hiding from water in the middle. In fact, you can see that if you do the ribbons diagram like in part C, you can see how they're all in the middle. And if you turn on all the other ones in blue and keep those in yellow, you do a space filling thing. You can see how the blue ones cover up the yellow ones. There's a few yellow ones peeking out. The proteins aren't hard and fast followers of every single rule that we make for them. But the general rule of the leucines, isoleucines, valines, and phenylalanines are on the inside. That's a decent rule. 90% of the time, it's true. So myoglobin was one of the first proteins to be solved, and it really tells us about tertiary structure. We actually will talk about its function when we get to the next chapter, but that's after the test. What did we know when we just got the crystal structure of myoglobin? What did it say? Well, right there we showed you most hydrophobic residues, yellow ones, are buried. Contrary-wise, if you did the same thing for polar residues, you would see that they're more exposed than buried. The interior is very tightly packed. For all those atoms coming together with all the restrictions they have from being part of amino acids, there's only space for four waters inside. It's a very well-packed structure. Now, on the other hand, there are four waters inside, so there are little gaps where water can get in. But water gets in everywhere. The fact that there's only four means that it's actually a really tight 3D puzzle. It was the first direct evidence that they had that Herman Branson was right. Um, and other people said Linus Pauling and Robert Corey as well. But people already uh, hear about them. Herman Branson was right. Alpha helices are there. And it was the alpha helix and not the more loosely formed gamma helix. Prolines. They were not in the secondary structure. They're not in the alpha helices. Three of the four of them were at turns or loops. So that means that most prolines don't, aren't compatible with either alpha or beta secondary structure. The other thing that they found out is what's its quaternary structure. Because when you solve the structure of it, you see how multiple chains relate to each other. Remember that hemoglobin actually has four chains of this related to each other. So here's an example of just some complex quaternary structure. This is a small protein called Pure E. It's only 17 kilodaltons. Pretty small as a protein goes. 
Uh, but it works as a octamer, 136 kilodaltons when they all come together, and it's not functional when it's just one chain. It has to be all eight chains coming together. And in fact, one of the reasons why is that its active site, which is the place like the heme where the important part of the chemistry happens, the active site is at the interface of three chains coming together, three protomers. So quaternary structure forms the active site of this enzyme. It's an extreme case, but quaternary structure can be important as well. Usually we're talking about tertiary structure if we're talking about an active site, but not always. So the other thing to think about is quaternary um, tertiary structure. How do secondary structure elements come together? We can see units. So if you look at this, it's all one chain. So technically it's all tertiary structure. But if you look at this, the one chain definitely has four distinct units. It's like beads on a string. And so if you can see this, you call the different beads different domains because there are units that look like they could be independent. They are useful to describe them as independent units. And in fact, these are very useful to describe it that way. They are immunoglobulin domains. By the way, I'm teaching immunology in the winter. So I invite you to consider that class as a biochemistry student, um, I can't include that much biochemistry but, uh, in the class because it's not a prereq, but I can't say it won't help, you know, uh, um, because I'm a biochemist, I'm an immunologist, and I look at these polypeptide chains and there's four units on one chain. Um, these are what you build most immunoproteins out of, these exact beads on a string. There's four domains here, and you can have different numbers of domains and different immune system molecules. So this is still one chain. So technically tertiary structure, but uh, domains can be used to describe either tertiary or quaternary structure. The one thing about this is symmetry. So when you have the same chain coming together, then it's going to have some kind of symmetry that relates the two chains together. If you have more than one chain, you're talking about symmetry, and you're talking about quaternary structure. And so the way we talk about quaternary is we say, what is the element of symmetry that we have here? Now, um, if you've taken symmetry in another chemistry class, you've heard that symmetry can be an axis or it can be a plane. For a plane to be true, you have to have a complete mirroring of each of the atoms. That is not possible in proteins because proteins are chiral. Don't worry about that if that doesn't make sense to you. Just trust me, there are not planes in proteins unless you have an artificial situation. Natural proteins must have at most rotation axes. Here's one where you have a dimer, two identical chains, and they are related by a two-fold rotation axis. You see how if you have a sort of axis going up and down, you could spin those around and if I spun them around 180 degrees around that axis, the red on the yellow, the yellow on the red, I would have the same molecule. I would not be able to distinguish that situation from the unspun situation. That is the definition of a rotational axis of symmetry. So I want you to look at this one. Hemoglobin, four of these guys, they're put together. It has rotational symmetry. In fact, um, but I'm going to ask you, where is the axis? So in your mind, now realize that this has two chains on top, two chains on bottom. They are all the same chain when it comes to tertiary structure. So how could you rotate this 180 degrees? Where would you put the axis? Where would you spin it? And I just pointed one axis. All right. Are there more? There's an axis going straight in and out there's an axis going up and down. If you spun it around the up and down, the light gray becomes dark gray and the dark gray becomes light gray. There's also an axis going side to side. This one's harder to see, but you have three axes for the three dimensions. You have the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. So you have three rotational axes of symmetry. So again, we, we call the rotational axis actually sets up one of the interesting features of hemoglobin. We'll talk about how it's actually made up of uh, chains that at the tertiary structure level are the same,
but at the primary structure level, they have a little bit of differences. We'll talk about that when we get to it. For right now, just realize that we're talking about two dimers that come together to form a tetramer. And so we can call it a dimer of dimers, and that makes sense because it means a pair of pairs. That's one way to say it, P-A-I-R. And uh, if you have a pair of pairs, you have four things. We'll talk about that. Here's where I play a song, but we're on YouTube here, and I'm afraid I'm going to get a copyright notice. So guess what? I'm going to do the embarrassing thing, and I'm going to try to sing a song for you, okay? Um, let's do a... Um, I have a, a friend whose kid is, like, obsessed with movie soundtracks. So that's the one hint. Which movie soundtrack is this? If I play this, I'm not going to ask which movie it's from. I'm going to ask who it represents, which character. And you have musical motifs that represent certain characters. Okay. So if I do... Okay, you might recognize it from that. That's the minor motif, or the secondary motif. Do you recognize it yet? Which movie it is? But of course, if I do the primary motif that's overlaid on that, so you do the... It's hard to do. I started in a really bad key. Okay. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 So say who that is, is Darth Vader, right? Okay, so hopefully that won't get the copyright lawyers. Um, John Williams, I'm sorry I mangled your uh, wonderful composition. The thing about Star Wars is they have different musical shapes that represent different characters. That's Darth Vader. And then there's da, 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 da. And there's one for the Force. There's one for like Luke and Leia. Um, there's all sorts of things. So... You have the, the, it's one of the things, the reasons why I love John Williams' music, because you can work, it works on another level. The structure of the music represents something else, because you see the same structure in different situations, and you recognize it. This happened with proteins. When we started to collect a whole bunch of proteins, people started to recognize certain shapes. Even though it's a different protein, and the other shapes around it might be different, you could recognize this little core shape. They called it motifs. And so they use that just like musicians use motifs. Protein motifs are the exact same argument. By the way, John Williams is great, but the whole idea of using motifs, it actually goes back much older than him. Uh, the, the, my favorite person for doing this is Richard Wagner, who did the ring cycle. Um, but I won't sing that. It's okay. Okay, so the the whole thing is motifs are small little bits. It's like da 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 da. That's a motif, but the whole song where it repeats the motif several times, that is the whole song. The protein motif is a small bit. When it's repeated, it is a larger bit that is a fold, not a song, but a fold. Here, fold is a noun, not a verb. Here are some motifs. So protein motifs that you see, beta alpha beta loops alpha alpha corners, and even a beta sheet, you can argue that is a protein motif because it is beta strands put together. I'll take it. Beta barrel, I'm a little skeptical of, but your book puts it in that category. So whatever, we'll go with them. I don't think it's small enough. I think I would call beta barrel a fold, but you can see you can argue about this. Just like you can argue about Star Wars all day. You can argue about protein folds. But what if we used AI to identify motifs. I wonder if somebody's done this for music. But you can do it for protein shapes and you can say, AI, tell me what the repeating shapes that you are, that you see over and over again. And um, they, the computer found 24 different motifs that it found over and over again. And these go, some of these are secondary structure because those are repeating motifs but you see, some of these are com most of them are combinations of secondary structure. And I think this is valid. This is a good use of AI because it, it systematizes what we already know. And it might show us some possibilities that we might have missed because we're looking at it with human eyes. This is sort of the alphabet for proteins. You can imagine these little units are put together and you put them all together into one protein. The motifs are small, they combine to form a fold.
And the, our last topic is that there are specific kinds of protein folds. They start to see patterns, and proteins use those patterns because the protein evolves to function. It evolves from what's already there. One of the ways to evolve from what's already there, repeat what I've got twice and then put it together and see if something works. And so it's e pretty easy for a gene to copy itself, to make two domains where there was one. And then those can be a repeated motif that will actually end up making a functional protein. So the motifs can be repeated to get big patterns and the folds will be larger than motifs. A beta alpha beta loop can be repeated to make an alpha beta barrel. And you see how that uh, the one on the left is not really an intact protein, but the one on the right, that's a nice protein. Okay, that looks like one of the things that Jane Richardson drew. So there's actually been computer studies of these to say, well, if we can classify motifs and come up with the 24 fundamental motifs, can we classify folds? And yeah, yeah, you can. It's just a little looser. It's a little bit like coming up with the language. Um, so you can see right here they have sort of the motifs as part A, and you can say fibrous prote proteins put together motifs in a certain direction. Globular proteins on the bottom put them together in a, a glob, you know, in a fold that is self-contained. By the way, I'm not sure you can see it. My picture might be in front of it, but they do show the ferrodoxin fold at the very bottom. That's kind of cool because we talked about ferrodoxin. And so this is why, remember how we talked about if you have all L or all D, you can make a decent protein, but if you have a mixture of the two, you can't. This is why they don't come together because you need the consistent chiral center to be able to form the consistently repeating hydrogen bonds. If you have a mixture of them, you can't form secondary structure. So one of the answers to why do we have all the same uh, chirality of amino acid is because we make proteins out of repeating secondary structure units. And you can't do those if you've got going back and forth between an L and D. All right. So the last thing I do I want to do is I just want to say there are different ways to name proteins. And uh, these show you the different levels that you can name something at. Just like you have a first name, a last name, um, and then you have a uh, family that you're related to. And then you have a um, tribe that you're related to. You know, the wider and wider levels that you get to. Proteins are related the same way. And you can name them at the different levels. You can name proteins by their tribe. So you can name all these proteins as all alpha proteins. And you can see they are very different arrangements of alpha and very different functions but they all do fit into that structural category. So we can call these different categories that we come up with families, or even if they're big categories, superfamilies. All alpha would definitely be a superfamily. They have examples of the different things, and sometimes fold and family are the same thing. If it's a common protein, basically roll with it. Realize that you can look this up in, in the lab, and we probably will have you look it up for sidericalins because we're going to be working on those in the computer. So just be used to the idea of shifting back and forth between names. Working with proteins, you want to realize that they have more than one name, you know? It's true of Russian novels, it's true of proteins, okay? Um, all beta proteins look like this, and again, all beta can be 90% beta. You see a little tiny bit of alpha structure, but we're going to include you in the family even if you're 10% alpha, okay? Uh, but you can see these are three all beta proteins. And then you can have half and half. These proteins have significant alpha and significant beta together. These are called alpha slash beta because these are more... Um, these units are more uh, integrated to each other. You kind of, you don't have an alpha side and a beta side. You have them sort of mixed together. If you look at the alpha plus beta superfamily, look at this. You have a protein that literally has an alpha side and a beta side. And over here you have the beta barrel, which is the beta side. And then you have an alpha side that's sort of on the top. These are more separated. So they are more alpha plus beta uh, is what they're called. Now you might ask, okay, what's the distinction between the two? The distinction probably started with humans naming it, but what if we tried to train a computer to tell the difference? 
and maybe from that systemization we'd be able to find out more about what makes the two groups of proteins different. That's the example that we have right here. I'm, I have this on your homework already. I think I'm going to print it out for you eventually and give it to you on paper. But you also, can, I believe you can do it from the homework, um, especially if you zoom in. And I, I might have a high resolution version that I give to you. But I want to explain what this is. This is super families. This is all proteins in the protein database. All structures, all sorts of different structures, like all the proteins we just showed you. The dots are colored by the super family. And if you look at the very bottom, if you can read it, I'll give it to you in the higher resolution. You can actually read it. Look at the very bottom because it tells you what the colors mean. It put the all alpha proteins, it colored them blue. All beta were cyan, alpha slash beta were red, alpha plus beta were yellow. Again, these are categories that humans came up with, but what we did is we gave the computer all the structures, and we didn't tell the computer what the colors were. We just said, hey, I want you to put all these structures on a table, and I want you to slide them around until the structures that are most similar are right next to each other on the table. And it did that. Then we turned on the colors. And we looked and saw, does the computer agree with what the human said? But the computer's just working on math. So if you just uh, arrange them by structures, the good news is the computer mostly agrees with the humans. You see it slid around all the all alpha proteins. It said which ones are more like the others. It put them together on the table, put them together on the left side of the table. We turn on the colors, we see all the, well, not all, but most of the dark blue dots are together. The computer agrees with us. These all alpha proteins are more similar than they are different. The all beta proteins, those are cyan. It slid those all the way up to the northeast part of the table. The northeast part of the table has a cyan colors and you see that those mostly go together. This is where it gets interesting because we can ask the question, is alpha slash beta more like all alpha or more like all beta? Well, that's what we can use this for. We can argue about it until we're blue in the face. But we can look at this. What's the color of alpha slash beta? It's red. Where are the red proteins? Are they closer to the blue or to the cyan? And look at that. It slid them down to the bottom of the table right next to the blue. That means that the alpha slash betas are more like all alpha proteins than they are like all beta proteins. Alpha plus beta is yellow, and it appears to be actually caught between the two. It's in a different place on the table. It is actually next. It is more like the all beta proteins. Just remember, being close to each other in this diagram means the computer has said you are structurally similar. And our categories work. The other question, I think I leave this for the homework. Small proteins. Where are they on the table? Are they closer to um, the... Which colors are they close to? Are they close to all alpha or all beta? Are they close to alpha slash beta or alpha plus uh, beta? And the final thing is membrane proteins are shown in magenta. What are they like? Actually, look carefully because I actually see two. There's one major magenta thing. There's another little tiny magenta thing. So, all that is to say, domains from the same class come to lie in similar regions of the galaxy. They're calling this a galaxy. I call it a table. But this is how it works. The computers and us agree. So on that note of optimism, we are basically caught up to where we need two more lectures to get ready for test one. Monday, Wednesday, review on Friday, test on Monday. We still got a week and a half, but if you're listening to this, then hopefully you've got time to get ready for it. All right. Have a good weekend. I will see you on Monday for our demonstration of how x-ray crystallography works.